I've often quoted as saying I would rather be governed by the first 2,000 people in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the 2,000 people on the faculty of Harvard University. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. They share our beliefs, our convictions, our hopes, and our dreams. These are the conservatives of the heart. They are our people. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Johnny and James. Let's begin with this week's student member question. This one is from Dylan. What is the best way to build conservative communities on and off campus amidst cancel culture? James, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean... One thing I would say immediately is definitely to reach out to ISI. We have um, on-campus groups all across the country, over 120 of them. They, you know, they function as reading groups or debate clubs or just uh, social groups for conservatives. And I think that that can be a really helpful way to sort of have a um, have an overarching organization that can help you build those communities. In addition to that, though, I would just say that you know you you have to start somewhere, and you do have to just reach out to folks. I think a lot of times conservative students will say, well, you know, cancel culture is really hard to deal with and this and that, but they're not necessarily putting the effort into starting those communities. And so you do have to be intentional about it. Um, and so that would be that would be my advice is to is to reach out to folks who, you know, you think might be a conservative or or reach out to a professor who, you know, is um, friendly to yours to open discourse and, and just just start a group. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, you know, conservatives are are good about complaining about everything that's going wrong. And they're there's also they're also very good about ideas about how to combat what's wrong, but they're not always the best at organizing. And that seems to be a strong suit of the progressive left, especially on campuses. So I think uh, a lot of it is just, you know, you can talk about it, but uh, at the end of the day, you have to do something about it. And I really like James' suggestion of finding a conservative or even a, you know, sort of an open-minded, old-school liberal professor who might have reading suggestions or who could even be willing to host, you know, a dinner group or even just come and talk. You know, you could have a rotating series of uh, of speakers, of professors come and talk to you. But there are a lot of resources at your disposal uh, if you're willing to organize and and get together and be action oriented. I just think that that faculty member who can sort of guide and be a mentor and lead is so important. Yeah, especially because so many of the questions, you know, that students are facing as relates to cancer culture, they didn't come out of nowhere. This isn't yeah. brand new in 2020, right? 2021. Uh, this is stuff that had has intellectual origins going all the way back to you know, a long time, you know, uh, at least to the 60s, but probably far, far earlier than that. And so it does help to have a professor or faculty mentor who can really kind of help you to zoom out and kind of see, you know, the the overarching intellectual and tr- political trends that are really creating the culture to begin with. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's definitely a conservative way to start a community is to go to someone who's older and wiser than you and seek guidance. So that's right. Um, so Johnny, tell me, what are you reading right now? Yeah. So I am uh, the Orthodox Lent actually began uh, on Sunday. So I am reading a book called Everyday Saints by Archimandrite Tikhon. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's basically a book um, about you know, uh, or Orthodox uh, living in Russia behind the uh, during the period of the Soviet Union. And um, it tells the story of just ev- literally what the title is, everyday saints. So you're sort of, you know, getting stories of what local businesswoman who owns a number of grocery stores, she goes twice a year to the monastery and spends a week there and meets with her spiritual father and, and with the monks. And so you're you know, just seeing these stories of uh, miracles, of spiritual direction, and it's really been encouraging. And also, some of these monks are quite uh, quirky and and witty and <laughs> give funny penances. And uh, it's just a, a fun read and a good spiritual read for Lent. What about you, James? Yeah, so I just finished up a book, um, a new book by Nigel Bigger, um, and it's called What's Wrong with Rights? And it's a it's a really I mean a really fascinating book. I actually I got to use um, a bit of it for my undergrad thesis when I was when I was finishing up school before it came out and getting to dive back into it. Really, so what it does is it's 
it's sort of trying to provide a uh, proposal for prudence um, when thinking about rights. So Bigger is not really, um, he doesn't buy into the sort of the Finnis Natural Law School or the George Natural Law School um, or Natural Rights School. So he uh, he wants to try to bolster a, a Burkean understanding of rights, I think, um, which is not necessarily, you know, if you spend any time around ISI circles or Hertog circles or anything like that, you'll have almost definitely have heard someone say, you know, rights don't exist, which, you know, I think it puts it far too simply. And, and Bigger is really trying to draw out the subtleties in the argument of, you know, should we, should we conceive of rights as fundamental to ethical discourse or should they, should they be in the mix as something that can be used or not used in any particular situation? And what is what is Bigger's background? Uh, he is a Christian ethicist, um, but specifically, he's thinking a lot about the just war tradition. Okay. So, it, for anyone who studied the just war tradition, it is you know steeped in context and sort of taking in context, right? And that's what this book is all about: is taking the context of whatever right you may or may not be able to claim. Fascinating. So, James, tell me, what did you think of our conversation with Ross Douthat? Uh Yeah, it was. It was really, it was a really great conversation. I enjoyed getting to talk to Ross. I mean, I really, I really liked his book, The Decadent Society, and um, and I've been reading his Substack now as well, which has been very good. And you know, what strikes me about Ross is that he is one of the few journalists, even just regular writers, who is constantly appealing to fiction. And if you if you read the Decadent Society or if you have read the Decadent Society to students out there, it's really I think take note of the fact that Ross is always referring to fiction. He has this very morally imaginative way about him, and I think that um, I think that that's really something that a lot of us could learn from. Yeah, absolutely, and certainly you know in today's political discourse and uh, Twitter discourse, you really don't see many appeals to fiction. You know, fiction has kind of gone by the wayside. People like to read political philosophy, they read history, but literature and uh, the imagination really seems to be, you know, it, not not really as much in the picture. And I know when I was in college, I just, uh, you know, I was Christian studies major, but the real the real reason I was a Christian studies major is is most of my courses were English uh, literature. And oh. so uh, it was really kind of doing theology and religion through the lens of the great texts, you know, going from from the medieval period all the way today uh, in terms of storytelling. And I think that's also what made, you know, C.S. Lewis such a, an effective um, apologist. So yeah, I certainly admire that about Ross. And I also think, you know, generally he, you know, he always provides a smart and nuanced take on where the right is going. And he does a good job, you know, with his perch at the New York times, which I'm sure is, um, you know, challenged to, to sort of the lone conservative at the times or one of the few, remaining. So I think he's always a, a relevant and prescient voice. And I've been excited that he's been more plugged into ISI's programs. He's actually done a, uh, he did a debate for us on the future of conservatism a few weeks ago, and he's going to be speaking at one of our um, donor events in Dallas in a couple of weeks. So I'm really thrilled that we're able to integrate him a little bit more into the ISI program. Yeah, I agree. He's he's certainly someone to to pay attention to if you're interested in sort of seeing the di- the direction of the conservative movement and not not necessarily getting a a take from one side or the other, but getting something that's a little more trying to think deeply about where we're headed. And I think, you know, I think as to draw back to the literature point, I think that's actually a result of his reading so much literature, right? He he has this um, ability not to just see things uh, out of – see things sort of in a vacuum like we currently live in a vacuum or something like that, but rather in the wider context of the Western tradition, um, which I think is helpful. Absolutely. Well, before we get to the interview, uh, just a quick note about this podcast, which is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to help us in that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like you. Now, let's get to the interview. We're joined by Ross Douthat, whose book, The Decadent Society, America Before and After the Pandemic, published by Simon & Schuster, just came out with a new paperback edition. So we're excited to uh, talk to Ross a little bit more about his book and how he has revised his theses or not from uh, last year when it came out in March. But before we get to that, 
welcome to the show, Ross. I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the debate that you participated in for ISI a couple weeks ago. Yeah, well, th- first, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It, it was really nice to see you in person. This was, the, I think, the first uh, time I've taken a train to Washington, D.C. in a year. So um, that was that was interesting. <laughs> It's always nice to argue argue with people. Most of the people in the debate were there on stage with us, um, even if Bill Crystal and Catherine Mangu Ward were beamed in on large Star Trek style screens. But it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm just I'm just sorry that you know Charlie Cook's plummy British accent persuaded more people to vote for him as the winner than than for me. That's right. You need to yeah you need to work on that uh, that accent, Ross. I do well. I've you know I have a lot of accents, but it seems it seems sort of inappropriate to like affect a Scottish brogue just for the purposes of you know crushing crushing Charlie in an ISI debate about the future of conservatism. Maybe maybe if we do it again in five years, I'll consider it. There you there go. go. You got to do the Buckley the Buckley accent. That'll get it. That's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to attempt a Buckley accent on this <laughs> podcast um, because it's 9 a.m. and I'm drinking coffee rather than something stronger. But, yeah. but you know, for late night ISI podcasts, I'll, I'll consider it. You know, Ross, I, I'm not sure we sent you your honorarium from the debate yet. So I think, uh, you know, a Buckley impersonation is going to be required. I, I don't know if you saw that in your contract. Oh really? Oh well. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't 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 keep threatening me like that, or I'll sock you in the face, and you'll stay plastered. <laughs> <laughs> All right, check check is on its way. Uh, <laughs> so, question question about the debate got lots of feedback. We had uh, I think you know three hundred eighty people at least watching, responding, engaging with the debate. You know, one of the questions that I had is hearing the, the sides debate back and forth. Is the, the, you know, right now we're sort of we're in this uh, period of, well, I don't know, there's, there's sort of intellectual ferment going on. On the right, you see, you know, National Review and Claremont dueling back and forth with each other about the new right. Uh, but yet at the same time, if you kind of like zoom out and look at what's going on in the wider culture, you know, Republicans and conservatives, I don't know if they're really even having these conversations in the debates. You know, they're they're more so... Uh, laser focused on the culture war issues, the cancel culture, things like that, critical race theory. Um, So, you know, my question to you is beneath the surface, these debates happening on the right between libertarians, populists, nationalists, uh, you know, is it just like, is it like the band on the Titanic sort of arguing about what song to play next as the ship is sinking? Or are these debates actually important to to the future of, of what goes on in this country? No, I mean, I th- I think they're they're important. Um, obviously, like you know, when you're the kind of person who writes columns for a living and participates in these kind of debates, you can sort of exaggerate their importance a little bit. But you know, I mean, I think fundamentally, just just in the debate we had, you know, you saw a couple really interesting splits that actually I think were sort of reproduced in the voting on on who on who won, right? So you had, you know, you had a sort of optimism versus pessimism split, right, with, you know, where um, questions about, like, you know, how how dire is the situation for conservatives versus how fundamentally optimistic should we be about, you know, the basic soundness of American constitutionalism and so on. Um, so that's one division. And then you had, I think, a real division um, that maybe I pushed on a little bit about, you know, to what extent can conservatives use government and should should conservatives use government power um, to effectively not to sort of make economic policy in ways that maybe are more active than um, sort of free market conservatives have assumed in the past and also maybe to have influence on those kind of cancel culture battles that you're describing like you know what is it what is what is the appropriate way for conservatives to think about like influencing the modern university right like is it just sort of writing outraged pieces about how liberal the ivy league is or is it thinking seriously about like you know education policy and how you how you spend money on state universities and how that affects the culture of campuses um so i think i think there's i think those are sort of two interesting divides like are you fundamentally upbeat or are you filled with you know doom and despair and you know do you regard sort of the consolidation of progressive power as something that can be just sort of 
defeated with sort of with kind of libertarian argumentation or do you see state power as having a bigger role to play not least because state power is kind of the only power and this was my my point at the debate kind of the only power that's available to conservatives at the moment now that um corporate america you know is sort of becoming much more progressive in its at least its sort of public rhetoric you know the military is currently at war with Tucker Carlson. Last time I noticed, uh, so the, the the list the list of of sort of natural allies for conservatism is getting a little thin. Yeah, that no, that's right, and I think the you know a lot of it goes back to as well sort of confidence in our institutions. I think with Charlie Cook, you know his kind of main takeaway, you know, and I've encountered a lot of conservatives who have this perspective, but it's sort of like as long as you get the the process right of constitutional government, you know, like everything else will follow. Sort of, it sort of seems to be a bit mechanistic. And it's like, as long as we can get the, the, you know, the system working again, we can kind of crank out the kind of outcomes. It'll naturally crank out the kind of outcomes that we want. Or if it doesn't crank out the outcomes that we want, at least the, the vices of the system will be mitigated because it'll be, you know, California can do whatever crazy thing they want to do and, and Florida can do what they want to do. And that's just right. And and, Char- and Charlie lives in Florida, as he himself, I think, conceded. Right. So and, and the view, I think a certain, you know, a certain kind of deeper conservative pessimism often flows from, you know, being a conservative who lives in New York City or Washington, D.C. or, you know, or California. I mean, I, I think the deepest pessimists that you will find and the people who were you know, most enthusiastic about Donald Trump and sort of most enthusiastic about like basically the idea that conservatives need to be thinking in terms of regime change or something. These are all conservatives from California, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas That's the right. conservatives yeah, yeah. Who, are, who are here saying, you know, federalism works, you know, fusionism is still the way to go. They're really often in Texas and Florida, right? Um, you know, and I don't think that's I don't think that's a coincidence at all. Ross, one of the things, one of the sort of phrases being thrown around a lot in this in this debate between conservatives is the phrase neoliberal. Right. We have like the on Twitter, you have the the neoliberal shill bracket, you know. And um you have folks like Scott Linscombe on there, but you also have folks like Janet Yellen on there. And so one of the things that I've had students come to me multiple times and ask, you know, what what is a neoliberal? Like how do you how do you define a neoliberal? Like, and you talk a little bit about this in your book, sort of the um, the effects of neoliberalism. But so, I wonder if you could, you know, help students think through like, what is a neoliberal? I mean, Sam Gregg recently had a review where he was talking about ordo liberals and conservative liberals, and so there's. It seems like there might be a little more. Dis- there might be some oh, more boy. distinctions to be drawn. Yeah. <laughs> once you've, once you've used the term ordo liberal, then 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 we're all then we're all in trouble. I mean, I, I think the easiest way to think about it is that. Um, in the Western world after World War II, there was a pretty strong consensus in favor of a certain level of sort of government management of the market economy. So it wasn't that the market economy had disappeared. The West was not, you know, fully socialist or anything like that. Um, but there was a strong belief in sort of, you know, certain forms of regulatory management, um, you know, strong welfare states, redistribution and so on. And that model worked really well until the 1970s when it stopped working and you got the period, um, you know, that now very few people actually remember. But when I was young, it was a period that everyone remembered, right, which was sort of the, the years of stagflation where you had both rocketing inflation and slow economic growth at the same time um, and a sort of general level of kind of, you know, liberal misgovernment of um, of cities and you know urban policy was falling apart crime rates were rising so there was this crisis of the consensus of the post-war consensus and neoliberalism is basically the place where sort of free market conservatives like ronald reagan and margaret thatcher found common ground with sort of market-friendly liberals like bill clinton maybe like janet yellen right um and around a sort of shared um a shared sort of vision of economic reform that usually involved lower tax rates, a lighter regulatory burden, and big support for free trade and globalization, right? Um, so that's, so. I mean, you can extend that and say, you know, actually, we also had 
neoliberalism in sexual relations, right? Because you had this sort of deregulation of sex. I mean, and, you know, the sexual revolution is sort of neoliberal. There, there's lots of interesting ways to sort of extend it. But if you're just starting at the core, neoliberalism is are the things that Ronald Reagan, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush all agreed on. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. I, I think that... Um... I think that there are probably some helpful distinctions to make between folks like or like thinkers like Willem Ropke, right? Because Ropke's pro tax cuts, he's pro free trade because he's sort of he's been brought up in the Austrian school, but he's also sort of more on this side of uh, like I like I was mentioning earlier from Sam Gregg Ordo liberalism, which is sort of more interested in the institutions maybe that are mediating and you know like uh, like if you read um, Human Economy. It, a lot of what Rocky's talking about there is sort of, it sounds like Reagan era conservatism, but I don't know if you'd classify it as uh, neoliberalism. Does that make sense? No, I, I, I yeah, I don't think you would. I, I think that there's a, there's a str- a strong strain in conservatism um, that, you know, sort of shares that sort of agrees with certain Reagan era economic policies but thinks that those can be made to work together with a kind of communitarianism and localism that isn't just sort of, you know, um, free trade and cosmopolitanism world without end, et cetera. Um, I think the challenge for conservatives is that that didn't happen, right? Like the Reagan era opens into an era, uh, the Reagan era delivers stronger economic growth. It delivers the sort of core things that it promises, but the sort of communitarian side of things seems to fall apart, um, especially starting in the last 20 years, even faster. And that then I think like if you talk to especially younger conservatives now who define themselves against neoliberalism, that's a point they'll often make. They'll say that like, you know, 40 years ago, there was this view that, yeah, you could sort of do, you know, you could sort of restrain the growth of government, restrain regulation, let the free economy rip. But also, but but sort of preserve um, a lot of small C conservative goods, and if those small C conservative goods, family, community, religion, have instead dissolved, then maybe we need to rethink the whole agenda. I mean, my my take is a little bit different. I, I think it's I think the neoliberals were right. Um, it's just that, like, like one. Every policy response is contingent on certain underlying conditions, right? And so the neoliberals can be right about the situation in 1979 and even maybe the situation in 1995, but then they can also be wrong, as I think they were wrong about opening the way we opened to China, right? So like that, you know, you can get a situation that we have gotten with China where technically the opening to China worked. It did make everybody richer in the aggregate. But it both weakened the American working class and strengthened the hand of the Chinese Communist Party. And so getting richer overall <laughs> turns out to be kind of a raw deal, right? So that's that's the kind of thing where you say, look, it, it's not that neoliberals are sort of wrong in their analysis overall, but there are things that, you know, f- sort of sort of free trade forever or upper bracket tax cuts forever are going to get wrong as the world changes. Ross, maybe you can talk a little bit more. I mean, one of the things I I thought was interesting is that I think two areas where you really stood out in the debate is one, when ranking the greatest threats uh, facing America today, you know, you had big business at the top of the list, uh, where many of the other, you know, people on the the panel said either a combination of big business or big government or, you know, or big government generally. Uh, And then you also said that, you know, the greatest foreign policy blunder. I like the fact that you actually for, you know, phrased China's entry into the World Trade Organization as a foreign policy blunder. I, I think you, you said something like, you know, the Iraq war looks like it might be the biggest mistake now, but sort of in the long run, it could really end up being China's entry to the WTO. So what I'm wanting to know is how do you kind of reconcile, because you just said, you know, that the, the neoliberals are probably mostly right in, in certain core areas, yet you have come to these conclusions that now, all right, it's big business and China's entry to the WTO, that's a problem. So how do you, I don't know, how, how do you, I'm curious why you still hold on to the neoliberal framework a little bit if it's, those are your conclusions. Well, one, I think the, first, I think the neoliberal framework was right 
in a particular moment, Got right? It. Like big, big business was not the biggest threat to the U.S. in 1978. It yeah. just wasn't. Like the combination of, you know, big government sort of and broadly defined, right, to include some sort of failing economic policies, that was a much bigger threat then. So part of it is just that threats change. But part of it is also sort of seeing that what neoliberalism is good at doing and what it's not good at doing, right? So so take the case of big business, right? Neoliberalism says that, you know, the most important thing, I, I mean, again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, right? But um, that, you know, the most important thing in assessing like the power of a monopoly is whether, you know, whether it delivers low prices or not. Um, so if, if you have a big company and it's delivering low prices, then it can't be a conspiracy against the public interest, right? Because the public wants low prices. So what's, what's the problem? The only problem with monopolies is when they get so powerful that they can do price fixing and warp markets and so on. But so that, that implies, right, that Amazon is terrific because Amazon is, you know, a quasi monopoly in certain ways. It's not there yet, but it has sort of monopolistic qualities. But it's so cheap, right? Like, you know, it's, I mean, it's so convenient. Consumers love it. Um, you don't, you don't need a rival Amazon to, um, you know, except maybe during the pandemic to get your packages there on time. I, I ordered, you know, new masks for my kids to wear to their school yesterday and they came today. It's amazing, right? But what else is Amazon doing, right? Like, what is Amazon's effect on political and intellectual culture, right? <laughs> Having a, a entity that can sort of disappear conservative books, for instance. What's the effect of Amazon on the social fabric if Amazon ends up concentrating all of this power in a few mega cities um, and leaves you know, the rest of the country to languish? There's a, a guy named Alec McGillis, who's a terrific left of center writer who has a new book out called Fulfillment. That's basically just sort of a sociology of the landscape that Amazon made and McGillis lives in Baltimore and he has this, you know, this anecdote where, you know, he's with somebody demolishing a row house in Baltimore that will then the bricks will be used to build Amazon sleek campus in Northern Virginia. Um, so if you live, if you just average the wealth of Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, neoliberalism works. Every, you know, on average, everyone's getting richer. If you live in Baltimore, though, and you don't work for for a tech company, maybe that averaging doesn't work for you so well. So that's part of it too. You just have to say, you know, there's, there, there's, if your goal is, is simply certain kinds of maximization of average wealth, then neo, neoliberal arguments are still strong. But if you're maximizing average wealth and the social fabric of your country is coming apart and people are turning to populism and socialism in response, then maybe you need to adapt a little bit. So, uh, Ross, we'd love to now sort of shift over more directly to um, to the thesis of your book. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit, you know, what is the decadence? What is a decadent society? What is decadence? And what what sort of signs were we exhibiting of that? Are we still sort of exhibiting those signs after the pandemic? So decadence, in my definition, maybe disappointingly, doesn't mean like orgies and chocolate covered strawberries, although it you know can include those kind of things. It means stagnation, drift, and repetition at a high level of wealth and civilizational development, basically. So it's what happens to rich countries when their growth rates slow down, they stop believing in the future, they stop having kids, um, they stop inventing as many things, uh, and they start making the same superhero movies over and over and over again. So the argument is basically that from from some point around the Apollo landings, the Apollo mission, the moon landings, which is where I start the book, the Western world, Europe especially, but then America too, became decadent. We entered into decadence where we didn't collapse or fall apart. Um, you know, we're still a rich society, obviously, and, you know, notwithstanding some of the events of the last year, a pretty stable one. But technological growth slowed down everywhere outside Silicon Valley and the internet. Economic growth continued but decelerated um and you know social life became atomized again people stopped having kids rich societies the world over are not having enough kids to reproduce themselves and we entered into this sort of period of sort of repetition and stalemate i think in our intellectual and political debates where like to take a, a close to home example right i'm roman catholic 
my last book was about Pope Francis. And it's really striking how the sort of culture war arguments inside American Christianity um, are just the same arguments people were having in 1975. Um, and so basically the world changed dramatically from 1946 to 1975. And then in spite of what people assume, I think it's changed a lot less since then. And we're all still sort of living in the shadow of the baby boomers revolution. And we're not sure how to get out. So Ross, I, with the sort of the decadence as stasis, um, thesis, I'm, you know, it seems to me like the solution then must be sort of, you know, uh, some, some sort of innovation or creativity or new sort of, you know, striving for, um, you know, technological or national greatness in some sense. But what I'm curious is I know you're also concerned about, you know, the fabric of local communities and churches and civil society. Um, so is there, how do you think about what will be, yeah, how do, how do we achieve this sort of new wave of innovation and yet at the same time preserve those little platoons? So I guess, yeah, I mean, my, my thinking, which has evolved somewhat on this over, over the years, is that actually there's more of a connection maybe between general dynamism and little pr platoon resilience than people seem to think. Like, yes, it is obviously true that capitalism brings a lot of creative destruction that, you know, is can be bad for local communities in all kinds of ways. Um, but it's also true that when you enter into a period of stagnation, things sort of get worse together, right? So it's both the case that overall economic growth rates um, have slowed down dramatically. And also the case that over that period, local communities <laughs> have, have sort of suffered and dissolved, right? So it's, it's like people, for instance, people, people in the US are moving less than they used to, substantially less. People are less likely to move from state to state, you know, pick up and leave, leave their hometown, go somewhere else. This is surprising to a lot of people, but it's been a big change over the last 30 years. But that hasn't led to some great revival of local community. Instead, people are staying put because they're on unemployment and, you know, I mean, to, to sort of take the worst case scenario, abusing opioids, right? You have like all of these sort of neglected communities that aren't benefiting from, um, from economic growth and are sort of, you know, they're sort of st sticking together in stagnation and despair in a way. Um, and and that's, you know, and, and it, this is in certain ways that we were talking about neoliberalism. The problem with neoliberalism is that on the one hand, it has, you know, it has sort of delivered some of its promises. It has like made the developed world richer than, you know, it looked like it was going to be in the Jimmy Carter malaise years. But it hasn't actually delivered enough to, to sort of get us the kind of dynamism that can help every community. Neoliberalism has helped, you know, it's helped Silicon Valley, it's helped the Acela Corridor, but it hasn't, there's actually a higher level of dynamism that maybe paradoxically might be better for, you know, local communities as well. Um, now, you know, I'm not 100% sure about that, but that, if you look at the last 30 years, I think that's what you see. I think you see sort of growth and dynamism weirdly declining together with community, church, and family. Yeah. And I think even getting back to that Baltimore example, you know, at the time when Baltimore was thriving and, and flourishing and there was, you know, Catholic churches that were packed on a, at the corner of every single block, you know, you had, uh, at that time you had Bethlehem steel there, you know, how, I mean, the, the economy in Baltimore proper was booming, which, in large part led to the growth and sustenance of civil society in that place. So as, yeah, the, as the economy in that particular community declined, so did all the other institutions. Yeah. And there's also a way in which, you know, the kind of innovation you have matters, right? Like if you look somebody did a study recently of, of important new patents in American life over the last 70 years. If you go back to like the 40s, 50s and 60s, there are all these patents for, you, you know, like in in chemistry and metallurgy, right? Sort of like real world built environment kind of innovations that, um, you know, that have a different effect than the last 20 years when all the patents are in electronics and communications. And so if your innovations are all concentrated in 
basically what are virtual forms of, of um, life, right? <laughs> then you're going to get sort of, you know, negative, <laughs> negative effects on, on the real world, right? So the fact that it's, you know, it, the fact that we've had all this innovation that's only in the space of like our phones means that, you know, you live inside your phone more. That's where the action is. But if you live inside your phone, it turns out to be harder to find a spouse, you know, harder to be happy, all of these kind of basic um, human things. And I say this as someone who certainly lives too much inside my own phone while I'm chasing my children around. So I want to ask, you know, we're conservatives here, right? And we're, we think a lot about conservatism. And, you know, one of the things about conservatism is it's often trying to you know, uh, preserve our inheritance, right? And preserve the goods that come down from us from ages before. And, you know, it, when we define decadence as stasis or as sort of, um, you know, not changing in any helpful ways, and we're sort of seeking new innovation, I mean, I wonder, and, and I wonder, you know, specifically to sort of tilt this question toward the, the new right, um, you know, what's the difference between helpful innovation and innovation that really just steps away from tradition. And how do you sort of, how do you break decadence without breaking, um, breaking down our cultural inheritance? It's pretty hard. It's hard, right? And leaving decadence is dangerous in its own way, right? So, um, you know, you, there are ways in which, you know, to, in certain ways, decadence can, can freeze and preserve things that are good. So if you go to like, you know, a, you know, a nice neighborhood in a modern American city um, that still has all its old stock Victorian housing. And you find people in that neighborhood who are NIMBYs, right? Not in my backyard people who refuse to allow any new apartment buildings to be built, you know, any, any, you know, any, anything that changes the character of their neighborhood. Those people are preserving decadence, <laughs> right? They are preventing the economy from growing, they're preventing working class people from getting jobs in their city, uh, they're preventing new buildings from being built. But, you know, many new buildings that are built are hideously ugly. <laughs> and the <laughs> buildings they're protecting are genuinely beautiful. And so as a conservative, you have to have some sympathy for the impulses behind, um, you know, behind behind that kind of nimbyism. So I think that the challenge for conservatives then is, though, you know, you can't just have stasis, right? Like, uh, you know, um, tr the, the old line, you know, there's an old line, right? Tradition is the lit is the faith of the living. Traditionalism is the traditionalism is the dead really church of the dead. I'm mangling the line, but there is, there's some distinction, right. That's crucial between sort of preserving tradition and just sort of, you know, trying to preserve things in amber and just have stasis forever. So, so the trick is if you're a conservative to say, okay, you know, I agree with the local NIMBY types that, the old buildings are beautiful and the new buildings are more likely to be hideous. So let's figure out how to build attractive new buildings, <laughs> right? Like, like what does it mean to add new buildings to San Francisco so that more people can live there and the city just isn't like a museum for the rich with a lot of homeless people on the streets? What does it mean to build new buildings that are actually in keeping with the beautiful architecture of the past? I think that applies that sort of architectural example applies more generally, right? That like, if you are thinking, whether you're thinking about politics or religion or intellectual life, you know, historically, renaissances are called rebirths, right? They're not just called births. The whole idea of a renaissance is that you reach into the past to claim something and bring it forward into the future to enable a new, a new era. Um, and sometimes that can go disastrously wrong. Um, but it can also be a place where traditional sort of the, the, the pursuit of tradition in order to bring it forward to ch transform the future is the thing that conservatives should be trying to do. Yeah. So I wonder if I could follow up just quickly. And I wonder if you have any examples of like, quote unquote, new, new, you know, beautiful buildings that are being built in intellectual conservatism who can, you know, if students are wondering, okay, well, how do we break decadence and conservatism? Who should they be looking to? I mean, obviously the intercollegiate studies. Since <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I, I don't know. I think that there's, I think that conservatives haven't really done a great job of this overall. Um, I think that there is a, um, 
I think there's a lot of interesting intellectual ferment, as you said earlier, that's happening in, you know, sort of a range of big and small magazines on the right. I think, I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting time to be sort of a reader on the right to read, you know, to subscribe to, um, you know, everything from national review to modern age to, you know, the various Claremont Institute publications that are all feuding with each other in really interesting ways. So I, I think sort of intellectually, the the core range of conservative publications at the end of the Trump era are actually in pretty good shape. I think the challenge is, is the sort of translation of those ideas to to the real world, right? And And there it's a little harder. I don't think, I think the conservative position in the modern university is weaker than it was 20 years ago. Um, I think that, you know, the conservative position in culture industries generally, you know, never strong, but it's weaker than it was, than it was before. Um, so I don't have a sort of like, you know, go to university X or go work for company Y kind of advice. I think what you're looking for as a, as a, especially like if you're a conservative college student thinking about, you know, where am I going to work? What institution am I going to join? You know, you're, you're looking for places, you're not looking for places that in most cases are going to be super hospitable to conservatism. You're looking for places that seem sort of hospitable to debate and complexity and have people within them. And, and you can, I think you can often figure this out, right? Like if you're going to Silicon Valley, there are parts of Silicon Valley that are just sort of, you know, ruled by their progressive mid-level employees. And then there are parts of Silicon Valley that are not really conservative, but are sort of, you know, more freewheeling and, and interesting. And I think that's what you're looking for in, you know, in any situation, if you're thinking about going into academia, you know, which fields of study um, seem to have people who are sort of open, open to diverse styles, open to diverse styles of thought. Um, But also, you know, I mean, there is, you also as a don't want to like overthink um, the sort of, you know, meritocratic ladder in certain ways. And I know this is easy for me to say from my, you know, dubious eminence at the New York Times, but there is really a lot to be said um, for, you know, getting married and having kids at a relatively young age, right? Like there, there are things that are sort of conservative things to do that will, you know, affect your life in a profound way. Um, and might ultimately have a more positive effect on the culture than all the schemes that we dream up in in think tanks and elsewhere. Ross, we're we're about out of time for today, but just to wrap up, uh, one question that we ask, uh, you know, all of our our guests is whether or not they consider themselves to be a conservative. But even more importantly, as we think uh, towards our students, who are some, you know, if you're a young conservative in college, coming up through the ranks, you know, who are one or two authors or books who you think they should be reading to better understand the the relevance of conservatism uh, in the next five to 10 years in America? Um, so one, yes, I consider myself a conservative. I don't consider myself one in some sort of absolute and timeless way. Like, I think I probably would have been a little bit more of a liberal, um, you know, in 60 or 70 years ago, sort of pre pre 1960s, I'm not sure I would have been all the way there with Buckley at the start of National Review. And you know, and as when you're a Christian, you have to sort of recognize that sometimes Christianity is a conservative religion, and sometimes it's a radical one, there was nothing conservative about the early church. And there'll be moments as a Christian when you aren't going to want to sort of, you know, defend established institutions if they've if they're if they're really corrupt. So I, I don't, I don't believe in a timeless conservatism. I believe in a contingent one. But in the current moment, um, I, I definitely am one. Um, in terms of of reading, I mean, I think there have been actually a number of really interesting conservative books published in the last just in the, just in the last few years. I was just doing an event yesterday with Yuval Levin um, and Chris Caldwell, uh, who. Um, both published books that came out at basically the same time as my own book in hardcover just before the pandemic. Yuval's is called A Time to Build 
and Chris Caldwell's has called it the age of entitlement and Caldwell's is much more pessimistic and Yuval's is, he wouldn't say optimistic, but he would say hopeful. Um, but those, they're, they're both terrific books. And there's, a, I think there's sort of in certain ways, a bumper crop of, of books, but I, I think there's also value since I said earlier that, you know, a, a lot of my own thesis in my own book is that less has changed since the seventies than people think to going back and reading what people were writing in the seventies, right. To, you know, to go back and read everything from sort of, you know, early, early social and religious conservatives at the time, figures like Richard John Newhouse, um, people who are not necessarily thought of as conservatives. But if you go back and read like the essays of Joan Didion from the late 60s and uh, early 70s, they're actually, you know, she has a a famous critique of feminism that, you know, would get her canceled (laughs) today. (laughs) Um, and also a figure like Christopher Lash, who's sort of a man of the left who ended up becoming more of a conservative, who's had a little renaissance recently on, on the Internet. But the books he wrote in the 70s, the culture of narcissism, especially, um, I think, hold up incredibly well. Sort of critiques of individualism in in culture, I think, that just still totally describe American culture today. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of good stuff out there, but those are some ideas. Well, that is really great. Thank you, Ross. And, you know, now our, I guess our students have, you know, at least three or four books to read. You know, I got Lash, Levin, Caldwell, and your own book, which is out on paperback on Amazon right now. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Or from your local, less monopolistic, independent bookseller, which yeah. probably, <laughs> yeah. probably deserves your support as much as I, like any good writer, treasure my Amazon rankings. Be on the lookout for upcoming episodes featuring a lecture from Richard Weaver on relativism. And thanks for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org backslash resources to see all of the other offerings that we have for our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening, and don't forget to rate and review us, and we'll see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.